Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, oh, you all can do better than that. Good morning. There, that's better. It's good to see all of you this morning. Um, so you're going to have to forgive me this morning because I'm not feeling the best of the world, but that ain't going to stop me from worshiping the Lord. Amen? If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we want you to know that we are happy that you are here to worship with us this morning. I'm so thankful that our God is holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Let's all stand as we sing.
nothing that's going to stop me from worshiping him forevermore. And forevermore we praise you, Lord. We will serve you and adore you. We will bless your name forevermore. good all the time amen i agree with that we had a great weekend last weekend i hope that you were a part of it if you couldn't be here last weekend for our creation weekend i'm sorry you missed out it was a wonderful weekend had great food great teaching great fellowship and hopefully we can do that again sometime in the near future i talked to skip i said uh, man you taught like seven different things topics i said how many you got he goes i got 28 i said okay so we can have you back three more times great that'd be awesome you know, we'll touch the same subject one that's awesome uh just a couple now make sure you take your bulletin and look through that there's uh, several announcements inside there there's a handout hand a sheet for there that you can look at and see what's going on uh, you can see what the giving is and what's coming up i do want to make one announcement that's probably not in there uh, the ladies are planning having a breakfast this Saturday. I was, I'm sorry, lunch. Sorry, no, it's a, yeah, it's a lunch. Lunch at 12. I just, you know, I wake up at around 11.30, so I'm kidding. On Saturdays, not every day, so I'm kidding. 
Uh, no, it's a, it's a lunch at 12 o'clock at Mimi's. Is that right? Mimi's. And so that's going to be a luncheon for birthdays. Is that right? Okay, so birthdays for all the women, uh, not just for those that have had birthdays, but for, for all the women. Mimi's luncheon at 12 o'clock this coming Saturday, April the 9th. So if you ladies will make plans for that, put that on your calendar. I know that you will enjoy it. So uh, I want again, I want to say thank you to everybody that was involved with our, um, our outreach this last weekend. There was a lot of people that, that can be congratulated. I'm sure if I started mentioning names, I'd leave somebody out, so I'm not going to do that. I do want you to keep in prayer, though, one thing. This weekend, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a group in our church called the Faith Riders. It's a motorcycle group that uh, we like to ride together on occasion, and uh, we have been in conjunction with the food pantry. we got a food trailer that uh, we're going to be using to feed the homeless and to use for other events. And this Saturday, this weekend, we're actually going to be using it for a ministry down in South Carolina. There's a little church called Sandy Drain that, unbeknownst to you, you have already influenced in a, my, in a mighty way. I don't know if you know this or not, but let me just encourage you uh, by sharing, you, sharing with you this. This little church um, has been kind of revived by one of the members in our church. Uh, his, his son is down, lives down there. Uh, Kent Mixon, his son, lives down there. They've been reviving this little church. It was abandoned. Uh, weeds were all growing up around it, and they've cleaned it all off. They're, ref- they're fixing the structure, making it look more beautiful. And when we were remodeling, we gave them our pews. We gave them several of our pews. And that made all the difference in the world, got them excited. Then we gave them the, the lights that used to hang down in the, in the auditorium. We gave them those, and it's beautifying the church. And they are excited. They're meeting every week. They're, they don't have a preacher yet, but they're, they're meeting every week to sing some songs and just encourage one another. And so uh, Kent is taking the food trailer down there this weekend. Uh, he and Gail are going down there to help minister to them. They're having a big weekend. And so we're going down as a, as a church. We're sending a group down. We'll be praying for them at the end of the service, but we're sending a couple missionaries down there this weekend to minister to this little church. And then we'll be talking as a church of what more can we do to minister to this little startup church down in South Carolina? So church, you're reaching out beyond Farragut, amen, in Knoxville area. Things are happening. Great things are happening here. Miracles are happening at Grassy Valley Baptist Church. People are being ministered to on a weekly basis. We're seeing people fed. We're seeing people ministered to, prayed with, encouraged, and we're sharing the gospel. So thank the Lord, amen. God has been good to this church. We're seeing great things happen. Are you glad to be here this morning? I'm glad that you're here. Let's stand together. Let's turn around and shake hands with those around you. Let's welcome each other to Grassy Valley Baptist Church.
Thank you. We, I know we could fellowship for a long time. I say that every week. We love to fellowship in this church. One big, big announcement that I forgot to make, and I want to make that now. Tonight, please don't miss this. Tonight, Karen Peck and New River will be in concert tonight here in this church. Doors open at 5 o'clock, and the concert starts at 6. Uh, I will need a few men after the service is over, if we could. A few men could volunteer. We'll need to bring some extra chairs up here. I'm already getting phone calls. Even this morning, I was down in my office just praying and getting ready for the service this morning, and I uh, received two calls from people wanting to come here, Karen Peck, tonight. So uh, we'll have a, a large crowd tonight, so if we could get some help with a few chairs, extra chairs up here, it would be great. Right, Brother David? We'll need it. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessings upon this. Father, we thank you. You are a God of all creation. You are a God that supplies all needs. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. And Father, you've been so faithful to this church. The people here, Father, have been so faithful to give back, and I want to thank you for that. I pray this morning that as we give back into the Lord, as we worship you by this act of giving, that, Father, you'll take every dime, every dollar that's given, and use it for the blessing of touching people's hearts and lives. May it be used for your ministry and for your glory. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's so glad to see you. some of you out here. I haven't seen you for a while. So um, we're going to try this song here, and we're just going to play it off the TV screen. And uh, it's a song for all of you who had it real easy in life. This is not your song. So, but for most of you, most of us, this probably will help you a little bit. Weary traveler, beat down from the storms that you have weathered. Feels like this road just might go on forever. Carry on. You keep on giving. But every day this world just keeps on taking. Your tired heart is on the edge of breaking. Carry on. Weary traveler, restless soul. You were never meant to walk this road alone. It'll all be worth it. So just hold on. No more searching. Heaven's heat is gonna find where all the hurt is. When Jesus calls, we lay down all our heavy burdens. Carry on and on. Weary traveling, restless soul. You were never meant to walk to Hello! Someday soon we're gonna make it home. 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 Gonna make it home. Weary traveler. Restless soul, you were never meant to walk this road alone.
what do you do after, after that? What do you do after that? It won't be much longer before we're home. I'm looking forward to that day that we'll be home one day to see Jesus face to face. I'm so excited about that day. And it's because of what he did on that old rugged cross that he makes it happen. Because of what he did for us. And that's what Easter is all about. It's because of what he did on the cross. Amen. We will be with him forever and evermore. Let's all stand as we continue to worship our Lord.
grace, you, you may be seated. Yeah. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, please take them out and turn to John chapter 4. It's been a couple weeks since I've been in the pulpit. I want to say thank you to Brother Richard and to Brother Matt for filling in for me while I was gone. And I know that they did a great job. Uh, very blessed to have men that I can count on to teach the Word of God faithfully. And uh, so I appreciate them very, very much for... Uh, a lot of pastors have a hard time getting up their pulpit. We, we're very jealous of it, and so... We make sure that we teach. We have people that, that will teach the word faithfully and truthfully. You know, we are blessed in this church to have a lot of great teachers. A lot of great teachers. So, and since it's been a couple weeks since I've um, preached, you might want to go ahead and call the restaurant and make your appointment today for about two o'clock. Okay, because I'm gonna. Change your reservations, okay? Let them know that it'll be about 2, 2.30 before we're out of here today, right? I'm kidding, of course. John chapter 4, looking in verse 1. We're going to be looking there in just a few moments, but just before we do, let me just reiterate, re review a little bit, kind of get our mind back in the Gospel of John since uh, uh, Brother Richard decided to take us from the Gospel of John all the way to Revelation. Um, Skipped over all the other epistles. I appreciate that, brother. I'm trying to do this in chronological order here, brother. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But um, just to kind of get our mind back in the Gospel of John, just to review just a little bit, because I want you to get your, your thoughts back into what's going on. Remember, we have Jesus um, on his uh, mission. He's on his ministry. He started his ministry. We've already looked at the at Nicodemus approaching Jesus at night. As we approach this chapter, chapter 4, the Pharisees were trying to cause division by bringing jealousy into John the Baptist and his disciples, and more and more people, more and more people are going to Jesus to be baptized rather than John. And so we're seeing some some division happening, some jealousy taking place. And remember, John the Baptist kind of puts it all to an end. He says, he must increase, I must decrease. In other words, I've done my job. I'm doing what God's wanted me to do. I was to prepare the way. It's all about him. Wouldn't you love for all of us to be that way in everything we do? It's all about what Jesus is doing and not about what I'm doing, right? So that's the way John the Baptist was looking at it. And John, John is, is, is being very humble and doing his part in ministry. And Jesus recognizes what's going on. And to prevent any further division, he leaves and goes to Galilee by way of Samaria. And it's a direct route by going this way. Most of us would like to take the direct route. In fact, I don't think he had GPS back then, but it is the direct route. And, um, but few, did, few Jews ever took this route. In fact, whenever they were going to Galilee, and if they were leaving the area where Jesus was at at this point, they would have gone around, around your, uh, Samaria. They would have gone a different direction because Samaria was a hated place by most Jews. But in verse 4, I want you to look down in verse 4 of chapter 4, and I want you to see just one little phrase that's very, very important. In verse 4 it says, he had to pass through Samaria. Now, it, he didn't have to uh, it, geographically. Jesus didn't have to geographically, but he had to by divine appointment. Amen? Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Many of you can, at this moment, I want you to take just a, just a second and remember who the first one was that invited you to church. Who was the first one that shared the gospel with you? It was by divine appointment. They were listening to the Lord, and by divine appointment, you met that person at that, at that particular time to be where you are, and it's led you to this point today. Amen? By divine appointment, somebody shared the gospel with you. By divine appointment, someone brought you to church. It could have been a mom, it could have been a dad, it could have been a Sunday school teacher, it could have been a friend, it could have been a cousin, it could have been anybody, a friend. 
But somebody was faithful to listen to the Lord and follow a divine appointment. Jews and Samaritans had no social dealings. They couldn't stand each other. This situation dated back all the way to 722 B.C. when the Assyrian captivity was concluded by a guy by the name of Sargon who resettled nearly 30,000 people. He took the Jewish, the Jewish community in that area, took 30,000 of them away from that area, conquered them, and displaced them. And then he brought all his other conquered nations in. And so you had Jews who were still left there. You had Jews that were dispersed. And all of a sudden, they're cap- it's kind of just a, a mix, a hodgepodge of different nationalities all living together. And of course, they begin to have children grow up in that area. They begin to marry and intermarry. And the Jews didn't, the, the, Jewish, the Jewish people down in the southern kingdom, Judea or Judah, did not like it at all because they wanted to be pure blood Jews. And so when they saw them intermingling, they said, no more. That's, that's, that's taboo. We can't, we can't allow that. We don't like that. And about two or three years later, of course, or a couple hundred years later, we see Judea, or Judah be captured by Babylon. But Samaria was hated, and they were considered to be ceremonially unclean. Josephus, a Jewish historian, said this, he, and it's recorded in one of his books, he says, During the period of unrest that followed the deposition of Archelaus in AD 6, the Samaritans became so aggressive that they came privately into Jerusalem by night. And after midnight, they would open the gates of the temple. They would enter in and scatter dead men's bodies all over the temple to defile it. This led to civil war for a time, then to the intervention of the Roman authorities, and ultimately to a decision in favor of the Jews by Claudius himself in 51 AD. You see, the Samaritans hated the fact that they were hated. They wanted to be a part. And I'll give you more history and a little bit about that. But Jesus is coming in, in chapter 4. He's coming to Samaria. And Jesus is going to go against the grain on three major levels here. He's going to speak to a Samaritan, which was taboo. You just don't do that as a Jew. Number two, he was going to speak to a woman, which was another taboo. You just don't do that. And then number three, he was a rabbi priest, and he doesn't only just speak to a woman. He speaks to a woman that is of ill repute. He's not concerned about what other people think. He's not concerned about what his own disciples think. He's only concerned about doing the will of the Father and sharing the gospel. Sharing the good news. How sad, church, when we forget the main thing. When we get so caught up in doing programs or doing other things that we forget the main thing. The main thing is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So in verse 1 of John chapter 4, if you follow along with me, please. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, he but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. In verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. That's a divine appointment here. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey. Let me just say something about that. Jesus, this shows the humanity of Jesus here, okay? We know Jesus is God. We know that he is 100% God, but we also know that he's 100% man. And he had to travel. And as he traveled, he got weary. He got tired physically. So he's wearied from his journey. Was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which means it was around noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The, Samar- the disciples had, uh, so the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now the Greek word... Sun kro amai, 
is a verb form here where it means literally to use these vessels together. In other words, the Jews had no dealings. In other words, they had no use for Samaritans, and they would not even use the same vessels that the Samaritans would use. In other words, if a Samaritan was drawing water, and they would put the water into a big vessel, if they had a ladle or they had some kind of a spoon or a cup, the Jews would not even share the same vessel, not even the same water pot, not the same le- le- ladle, nothing, because they were unclean, according to the Jews. So it means that this is kind of strange. I mean, this really shook this woman up. She couldn't believe that a Jew would want to drink out of her own vessel, couldn't really believe that he was even talking to her, much less want to drink out of her own vessel. And that's what's really got her. Jews and rabbis had stated in the Pharisaical law that Jews and Samaritans were not allowed to use the spoons, the forks, anything that a Samaritan would use, they would not be allowed to use it. So this is really strange. And this woman is taken back. But I want to look at this passage in a very unique way. I want us to look at it from the worldly standpoint. This is not a church lady. This is not a Christian. She's of the world. And may I submit to you this morning that there are a lot of people in this world that are spiritually thirsty. Amen? You say Jesus is weary. Yes, Jesus is weary. He's tired. But he's using this opportunity to share the good news of the gospel. And this woman is here to draw water. And water that that she's going to draw, of course, is not going to satisfy. The Samaritan woman came to Jacob's well, which is about probably a half a mile to a mile away from the city, to draw physical water. There was plenty of water and springs all around the Judean hillsides, all over the place, but she had to travel outside the city because she was an outcast. And she had to come at a different time during the day. She came at the sixth hour, which was noon. Why did she come then? Because most of the time, women went to the well. And by the way, ladies, don't get mad when I say this, but this was woman's work. This is what they did in the Middle East in this age. The women drew the water. They cooked the meals. They kept the house. They, did the, they took care of the children. The men went out into the fields and worked and chopped the wood and grew the crops. The women had their particular place to do things. And women were drawing the water. And they would go early in the morning and they would go late in the evening because it was cooler to do that. But this woman goes in the sixth hour. Why? Because it's in the heat of the day and nobody would be around. She's an outcast. Why do you say that, Brother Mark? Because we're going to find out that she's been married five times and is living with someone that's not her husband. You say, well, that's not unusual. Well, we don't don't see it a lot. Even today, we see some of it. But this particular, this is five times. Married five times and now living with someone that's not her husband. So she's, even by the world standards, a little bit slutty. I hate to use that word, but that's just the way it is. She was not a, a good person. And so she's here at an odd time, and Jesus, a divine appointment, Jesus is there at the well. Now I want you to understand something. This is something God showed me while I was sitting here just thinking about the sermon. Even at the point of weariness, Jesus keeps the main thing, the main thing. Church, you may be getting older, and you may be getting more tired. You say, what can I do for the Lord? I'm tired. I'm physically not able to do it. You can continue to do the main thing. You can continue to share the gospel. No matter how old you are, no matter how tired you are, you can still do the main thing. Jesus, even in his physical tiredness, was still doing the main thing, and that was sharing the gospel. This was a woman who had looked for satisfaction in every corner of her life. She was disappointed. She was thirsty, not just for physical water but for spiritual water she'd been looking for something you ever met somebody like that they're trying to find joy they're trying to find happiness they try to find it in money they try to find it in in a good job they try to find it in a mate 
but then the mate disappoints them and so they get divorced or they, they leave or, or whatever happens in a, a lot of people's lives. They're looking for something. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of divorce in America. I think that's why we see a lot of people not even want to get married anymore. They just want to live together. They just want to find out, is this going to work or not going to work? They're looking for happiness. And it's hard to find. They're thirsty. They're thirsty for the very thing that God created us for, and that is for a relationship with Him. But they don't know what they're looking for, so they're trying to find it in other places. This woman was an outcast. She was the lowest, even in a secular society. She came to the well at the sixth hour because she didn't want to be around the other ladies. The other ladies didn't want to be around her. Didn't want to have the scorn, didn't want to be made fun of, didn't want to hear the the talk, and didn't want to see the ladies over there whispering and pointing at her. She just wanted to be left alone. The water which she drank did not satisfy, much like sin that we face today, doesn't it? You know, we talk about sex, drugs, and alcohol, the big three as being, you know, the things that people look for. They look for satisfaction in sex, or they look for satisfaction in alcohol, or even drugs, but we forget about the other things. What about envy? What about covetousness? People try to find happiness and complacency and self-interest and disobedience to God. They find their joy or they're trying to find their joy in selfishness or bigotry or gossip or discontentment. All of these sins will not satisfy. I'm reminded of a story. I read about this guy. This was a little historical uh, event, Thomas Constain's history, The Three Edwards, describes the life of Renald III, a 4th century duke in what is now Belgium. Renald was grossly overweight. And he was called commonly by his Latin nickname, Crossus, which means Fat. After a violent quarrel, Renald's younger brother, Edward, led a successful revolt against him. And this is what this writer says. Edward captured Renald but did not kill him. Instead, he built a room around Renald in the Newark castle and promised him he could regain his title and property as soon as he was able to leave the room. This would not have been difficult for most people since the room had several windows and doors of near normal size. And none was locked or barred. The problem was Renald's size. To regain his freedom, he needed to lose weight. But Edward knew his older brother, and each day he sent a variety of delicious foods. Instead of dieting his way out of prison, Renald grew fatter. When Duke Edward was accused of cruelty, he had, ready, he had a ready answer. He said, my brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. Renald stayed in that room for 10 years and wasn't released until after Edward died in battle. By then, his health was so ruined, he died within a year, a prisoner of his own appetite. You see, the sins that beset us are of our own appetites we seek to fulfill that which pleases us rather than that which pleases the lord so true isn't it but jesus comes to this woman and says i'm going to offer you something that is much more satisfying than just temporary water it's called living water and it will satisfy look down at verse 10 then jesus answered and said to her if you knew the gift of god And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now I want to make a point here. Remember, we've talked about this for the last several weeks. Remember, Nicodemus came and he was saying, I know you're a good teacher. Nicodemus knew who Jesus was. He he knew he was a, a, a man from God. And Jesus knew his heart. He knew that Nicodemus was wanting to know, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus had explained to him, he said, you know, it's, it, it can't be done by you. You, you can't do it. it. It has to be from God. All you can do is what? Ask, right? 
Did you notice that here? If you knew who was offering you this, all you would have to do is what? Ask. Ask. Spiritually thirsty people feel like they have the answer. Look down at verse 11. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, then you, where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank it with himself and his sons and his cattle? You see, she thought she had the answer. What was, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, you can only imagine what this lady's thinking. I mean, she's sitting there, first of all, as a Jew, and he's talking to her. She, he, he doesn't know who she is, and surely he wouldn't be talking to her, even as a Jew. But even as a man, he wouldn't be talking to her if he knew what kind of person she was. So when Jesus talks to her, asks her for a drink, she's thinking, he's out of his mind right? He's crazy. This guy's, he's got heat stroke. Something's going on with this man. I, surely you're not greater than our father Jacob. You're, you're talking about some kind of spring of living water? Really? She's got it all on an a, a, a understandable level, a, a human level. She's not thinking spiritually. She's still thinking in the worldly sense of how can I have everlasting gratification? How can I find joy in this life? She's still not thinking beyond. Now, let me just point out a few comparisons here. I want you to get this, okay? Nicodemus was a Jew. This woman was a Samaritan. Nicodemus was a man, and this woman was a woman. Uh, Nicodemus was an educated man. The woman was not. Nicodemus was high class and respected. She was low and poor and outcast. Nicodemus was recognized by Jesus as divine, because he said nobody could do these things except you do them from except God be with him. She didn't know who God was. Both thought they were spiritually secure. Nicodemus because he was a spiritual leader. The Samaritan because she thought she was in the play of, place of true worship, which is Mount Gerizim, which we're going to find out in a few minutes. Both were honest, honestly literal or materialistic in their reactions to Jesus' teachings. They both thought on literal terms. Both were spiritually empty and sensed a need for God. Both were spiritually lost, and that was the root of their problems. You see, you have one who was a spiritual guy who, if we were to have him come into our church today, we would put him in charge of every committee we have. We would make him a deacon. In fact, we might even put him on staff because this guy's walking the walk, buddy. He was a spiritual guy, yet he was lost. And then you have a woman of ill repute who some of us might even look at if she came in the back of the room and go, what is she doing here? How in the world, why in the world would we let someone like that into our church? I hope you never think that way, by the way. Amen? Amen? But it's sad to say there are churches out there that would do that. So you have, I think this is important, because John is pointing out one extreme to the other, isn't he? Do you remember what the whole purpose of John's book is? Remember? It goes back to the verse, the end of the verse, that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that in believing you will have life everlasting. That's the whole purpose. So what is John doing? John is showing us one extreme to the other. He's showing Nicodemus, and he's showing us the lady. One religious, and one not. Even today, and both of them, by the way, were looking for something. Looking, they were both thirsty. And they thought they had the answers. Humanists and Scientologists feel as though the answer lies within self. Evolutionists feel as though the truth is found in theory. Postmodernists feel that truth is found in relativism. Muslims feel that truth is found in Muhammad's teachings found in the Quran. Each one of these have a basic foundation. You must do something. You must work for your salvation. Goodness, morality, and all that are all based on works. That's how you get to heaven. And Jesus said, no. All you can do is ask. All you can do is ask. Jesus teaches that he is the answer. The Holy Spirit, which he shall give, is the well springing up. Look down at verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. He's talking about the physical water. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall become in him a well of water, springing up into what? Eternal life. So Jesus points out that the spiritual water which he spoke of is not something for which one strives, not something you earn, not something you buy, but it's something that I shall give you. It's a gift, amen? It's a free gift. Look down at verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have, you know, see, I think there's a lot of people out here trying to, they're trying to find out, they're trying to find their own way to heaven. They're trying to get their own way there. And they, 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 they try to get their own living water, their own water that will satisfy. And, and Jesus points out in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. In other words, we're trying to find something that is of no value, that doesn't last. There are people out there trying to find the living water in other things, and it doesn't happen. It's empty. Sin will take you farther than you ever want to go. It'll cost you more than you'll ever want to pay. Right? Man has always tried to find satisfaction apart from God. Adam and Eve tried to find knowledge of good and evil. The rich young ruler said to Jesus, All of these commandments I've kept from my youth, yet he was still searching. Oh, that our eyes would be opened. Jesus is the answer to our need. He's the one who can satisfy our deepest thirst. Which brings me to my third point. Spiritually thirsty people drink that which does not satisfy. Spiritually thirsty people feel like they have the answer. And thirdly, spiritually thirsty. Thirsty people are thirsty for real fulfillment. Look down at verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. She's still thinking on, the, on that simple level, on that earthly level, isn't she? They're searching for meaning, searching for answers. Some look for it in stars. Some look for it in service. Some look for it in meditation. Some look for it in their work, the things that they possess, in the things that they accomplish. The Samaritan woman looked for fulfillment in the men she married and the ones she was living with. And Jesus shows her herself and reveals himself at this time. This is exactly what he does with every soul. He calls them to himself. Look down at verse 16. He said to her, go, call your husband. And come here. And the woman answered, said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. This is this you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Man, wouldn't you love to have that ability to be able to see deep inside somebody's prayer? But let me just tell you something. You see what Jesus is doing here? I'm, and I'm, let me just say this about the gospel. The gospel is more than just sharing, hey, this is the benefit. This is eternal life. You need to accept Jesus Christ for the eternal life. Salvation involves showing the person they're sinners. It involves repentance. Amen? I can't read into a person's life. I don't know that what they've done in their past, but I do know this. Every person is a sinner, including myself. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means me. I have fallen short of the glory of God, and I'm a sinner. And that the wages of sin is what? Death. Death, separation from God. But there is a free gift. The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The gift of a well of living water springing up inside of you. Jesus performs spiritual surgery on her, and it becomes uncomfortable. He begins to point out that there's sin in her life. You see, more than just sharing the gospel, the good news, that there's eternal life, that God offers great things. And by the way, if all you hear is preaching that, oh, you need to accept Jesus Christ, he'll make you healthy, he'll make you wealthy, he'll make you wise, he wants you to have the best life now, I'm going to tell you that's alive from the pit of hell. Listen, Jesus says, he wants to give you everlasting life, but first, you must come to grips that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. 
And repentance is the only way to salvation. We must know that we need a Savior. Now let me just back up a little bit because she begins to change the subject. I perceive you're a prophet. Can you answer a question for me? Where's the best place to worship? Here or Jerusalem? That's what she's basically asking. So let me just give you a little history here. And I, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't push it off. He doesn't, he wants to answer. He, he loves her enough to even answer her questions. But let me just give you a little history here. In 720 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. <coughs> Some of the Jews that were left behind began to intermarry with the people that I told you that before that, um, from other places. And in the eyes of the Orthodox Jew, this was a, a gross sin and couldn't be tolerated. That's why the Samaritans were so hated. Now, it's interesting also that in about 450 B.C., 200 years later, the southern kingdom was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and had been taken captivity uh, to Babylon for 70 years. When they came back by the order of the new Persian king, they started to rebuild the wall. And you remember the story of Ezra, Nehemiah. Ezra built the temple, Nehemiah built the wall around Jerusalem. And uh, the Jews in the southern kingdom started rebuilding, and some of the Samaritans came down and said, listen, could we get in on this? I mean, after all, it's our city. We're a part of this. And they said, no, you're not. You intermarried, you've ruined your bloodline, you have forfeited your right to rebuild the wall when you intermarried. And then there are two guys, and I'm sure you remember these names if you've read Nehemiah. You remember a guy by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. Both of these guys were Samaritans, and they continued to irritate Nehemiah and to uh, persecute the people there. They didn't want them to rebuild the wall. So there was a real bitterness going on, real fight. Nehemiah was a leader. And Nehemiah did what God called him to do. They rebuilt the wall. And if it wasn't bad enough, the bitterness really came to a head because a renegade Jew by the name of Manasseh, and that's no relation to the king, by the way, a guy by the name of Manasseh married one of the daughters of Sanballat, and Sanballat was really an enemy of Israel. So when Manasseh rejected Jerusalem as the center of worship, he rebuilt a new temple on Mount Gerizim, up in Samaria and named it the true place of worship. So the woman at the well, since about 400 B.C., has now been taught, all the generations have been taught, that this was the true place of worship in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. While the southern kingdom in Judah was saying, no, Jerusalem is the true place of worship. So you've got two different places here. You got that? You follow me? Okay. So look down at verse 19. So the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So I, I, like, I, mean, I like the thought here. She's trying to understand this. She's still searching, isn't she? She's wanting truth. Listen, this is a thirsty soul. The world is looking for the answers. Not just spiritual answers. They're looking for what is missing in their life. And they know there's something missing. She's looking for what is true worship. They have, by the way, Samaritans had laws. They had the Old Testament. They knew what was right and wrong. This woman had been divorced five times. She knew what was right and wrong. She was an outcast. But she was still searching. She still wanted to worship. So then in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know, we worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And here it is, church. Here it is. This is when her eyes are opened. 
This is when her ears perk up, and this is when her heart is softened. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I am. That's the phrase, I am. Everybody, every Jew, every Samaritan knew that God was known as I am. For brevity's sake, and, and by the way, this cannot be done in one sermon, okay? I'll be hitting this again next week, probably for the next two or three years. But anyway, no, I won't. I'll be hitting this for a couple more weeks, but understand, this can't all be done in one week. For brevity's sake, we learn immediately that, Jesus, that the place is irrelevant. The place of worship, by the way, church, is irrelevant. It's here. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you, last night about 2.30, God woke me up, and I began to worship last night about 2.30 in the morning. It wasn't here. It was at home. I began to have prayer time last night. Just God woke me up and said, I want to spend some time with you. Woke me up, and I began to pray and began to worship the Lord at home. The place is irrelevant. It's here. So the... The text does not refer to the Holy Spirit, but an attitude of the heart which acknowledges God and sovereignty over our lives. There's a whole other sermon, we'll get to that, or two. But those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's, that which a thirsty soul longs for most is purpose and fulfillment and meaning. God created man not because he was lonely, but for man to worship him and enjoy him forever. This is meaning. This is fulfillment. This is our purpose. So I challenge you this morning, those of you that are watching us on TV, come to Jesus this morning. He is the living water that springs up inside John chapter 7, verse 37 says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, and the Scripture said, From his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Revelation chapter 20, 22, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride said, Come, and let the one who hears says, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost come. Come unto Jesus. During the days of uh, sailing merchant ships, there was a vessel that was off the south coast of Af uh, South America. They got stuck. Close to, the, close to the coastline, it was on a sandbar, couldn't go anywhere. A couple of weeks went by without the slightest movement of wind. The ship was helpless and couldn't move. The sailors were dying of thirst. When finally another ship drifted close enough to read their frantic signs for help, The passing by ship signaled to them, let down your buckets. They then found water suitable for drinking right beneath their boat. All this time, although they were adrift at sea, they were surrounded by fresh water, a current that came from the mighty Amazon River. All they had to do was reach for it. People don't need to thirst for true life because we are surrounded by his love. All we must do is ask. Amen. Church, take you can take this, by the way. You can take this illustration of Jesus and break it down and how to witness to people. What did Jesus do? He took the situation where they were at, what they were doing. He used that situation of water and thirst and said, come to me and drink. You could take any situation that you're in, a neighborhood, friend, co-worker, family. You could sit with somebody eating corn on the cob and say, you know what? How's that corn grow? God did that. 
You can plant the seed and you can water it, but God causes it to grow. Let me tell you about God and what He's done in my life. He's caused me to grow. You see, you can use any, any illustration you want to share the gospel. You can share the testimony. Take your situations. Look at how Jesus did it. He shared with them the good news of what salvation will bring, but he also pointed out the need for salvation because of our sin. He cared about the person and her, her desires to know the truth. He had the answers for her, and we do too, by the way. We have all the answers we need for life right here, right here. I don't need a self-help book to preach out of, and I don't need a, a magazine to preach out of. All I, I've got the whole Word of God right here. This is the truth, and this will help us in everyday life. But people are thirsty, church. Somebody may be here this morning thirsty, trying to find something that will satisfy. You've looked for it everywhere. You've looked for it in, in sex. You've looked for it in drugs. You've looked for it in alcohol. You've looked for it in friends. You've looked for it in money. You've looked for it everywhere, and you're not finding joy. You're not finding happiness. You're not finding peace. You won't find it until you come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Paul said in Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul knew. Paul knew that he was a sinner in need of a Savior. The good news that is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him would not have perished but have everlasting life. All who are thirsty, come. He is the well of living water springing up inside. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word this morning. We thank you for how we can know you as Lord and Savior simply by just coming and admitting that we are sinners and asking for you to save us, to be like the by the publican and saying have mercy upon me for I'm a sinner oh father that we would come and I pray that for that person this morning watching that person here I pray that they will fall on their face before you and ask you to be their Lord and Savior in Jesus name amen let's stand together